Well, I'll, I'll start with two who didn't like me when they first met me, and that's Kevin Mack and Reggie Langhorn. Why didn't they like I, you? They, they said they, I, they, I thought I was too cool. And I, and I you came in that. with rookie hype. I came in cool. After the play was over, I ran to the sideline, and I was looking at the video, and I looked over and said, I said, you know what's messed up, though? He touched my sock and knocked it down. Now the picture's gonna be messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again, and thanks so much for joining us on Club 46, driven by Bridgestone. I'm Jay Crawford, joined for this installment by one of the great return men in the history of the NFL. Ten times he took punts all the way for touchdowns. He also added a pair of kickoff returns for scores, 12 returns off kicks for touchdowns in all, and that is third all time behind some pretty good players to do it, Devin Hester and Brian Mitchell, the great number 21, Eric Metcalf. Eric, great to see you again. Good to be here. How are you? I'm good, and you? Good. So what have you been up to? What are you doing these days? I'm just hanging. You know, I'm just, uh, I do some consulting with Nike Track and Field. I coach a couple professional track athletes, and and none of that, I'm just trying to figure it out at 51 years old. Aren't we all? (laughs) (laughs) 13 years um, in the NFL, and six with the Cleveland Browns. Some great memories here. I'm wondering, when you think back on your time with Cleveland, what are some of the, the, the plays or the, or the moments that come to mind for you, your favorite times as, as a Cleveland Brown? Well, my favorite moment is uh, actually scoring a touchdown against the Raiders to, with a couple seconds to go. And I, and I tell people time and time again, it's because, you know, when you're a kid, you grow up, you're in the street, you think about scoring a touchdown with no time on the clock, hitting a walk-off home run shooting the bucket, go in with no time on the clock. And to finally get the opportunity to do it in the NFL was special. But because of the fans in, in Cleveland, I have to go with the two punt returns against the Steelers because yeah. that's, that's something that, that touches everyone. Everyone, you know, no one ever talks about, oh, you scored a touchdown last second against the Raiders. Everybody talks about the two punt returns against the Steelers and it just happened to be against the Steelers. So, the fans here have embraced it as number one, so I, I kind of, it's, it's one B to me. <laughs> How many times do you, do you imagine you played beat the clock in your backyard growing up? I, I think all my life. <laughs> all my life until I actually did it. I just, that doesn't know, happen very it, often. It, it, it like, only a handful happen. of times, really. I mean, you get more opportunities in a basketball game sure. or, or a baseball game than you do a football game. But So for me to, to have that opportunity, it was special because it's something that I always wanted to do. Do you have any favorite memories off the field? from your playing days in Cleveland? What comes to mind when you think about your time off the field here? Well, I think just hanging out with the guys yeah. that, that, I, that I play with, you know, just being here and, and hanging around the city uh, on days off and, and, and talking to fans. And, you know, like every Tuesday, some guys would have radio shows and everybody would go pop in each other's show and just and just hang out, eat food and, and drink and, and just have a good time. And so I just enjoyed just being around the teammates that I had, as, as well as the fans who were here. Who were some of your favorite teammates? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask for names, Eric. <laughs> okay, I mean, I got, oh, gosh. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with two who didn't like me when they first met me, and that's Kevin Mack and Reggie Langhorn. Why didn't they I, like you? They, they said they, I, they, I thought I was too cool. And I, and I you came that. in with rookie hype. I came in cool. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I came in being myself. You're just I mean, being Eric. I, that, that's, that's, they got what i So they sent been. swagger from you, and right away, they were like, uh, the alpha male kicked in, and we don't like this guy. Lange always says he thinks he, he thought, you thought you were too cocky, and I was like, no, I wasn't cocky. I was just confident in, in myself. I mean, just, but, you know, this, that's, that's, that's just part of the deal. And How then, did you win him over? I, I think on the field. Yeah. I think on the field, and then you know, just ha- just hanging out, just just learning who I am. Because now that I act the same, and they they just expect me to, to be the same. <laughs> but then, but then you got you know Eric Turner, of course, Webster Slaughter, uh, Lawyer Tillman, Michael Dean, Leroy, who's my neighbor when I lived. There's so many guys. That's like, a good cast it's, of characters, it's, really. You know, when you think about BK it. for sure. Just, you know, people I still talk to. So you know, it's it's, it's there's so many guys. So it's hard to to list them all. But like I said. The, what's important for me is just being here with your teammates. That's, 
I don't I don't miss playing football. I mean, I love playing it, but I don't miss it. But I just miss being in the locker room with the guys and and just hanging out with them like after practice and after games because that's what that's what the bonds that you form you never get back. It's interesting you say you don't miss it because I talk to a lot of guys that do miss it. They actually miss you know they don't necessarily miss Monday mornings and the way they feel, but a lot of the guys say they 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 do miss playing football. Why do you think you don't miss the actual act of playing? I, I mean you know. I, 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 w- I would love to play. I love football if I'm actually playing. When I watch it, it's, it's not the same to me. Yeah. I, I like cut watching college football more than pro football. Mm-hmm. And it's just, but I don't, I don't know what it is that I don't really miss. I mean, I would love to play it today, especially with the way they're getting paid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, would, right. I would really love to play right. today. Yeah. And, the, and the way the field is spread out, I, I think I'd be just fine. I'd probably be holding out right now. <laughs> but, but, but you know, I, it's it's just I don't miss getting hit. Yeah. And I, I never wanted to get hit, ever, ever. From the time I started, at seven years old, I, I was I was scared to get hit. How did you stick <laughs> with it then? If you didn't like most kids, when they don't like something, they just pull ripcord and they bail. Oh, I knew I could score touchdowns, and so that's I, I like doing that. So if as long as I make a guy <laughs> miss or two, I can I can score some touchdowns, and you know seven, eight years old, nine years old, and well, for a long, most of my life, I was faster than most people on the field, so get a little space and I could score a touchdown, so I, I like that a lot. I'm wondering what it was like growing up, son of NFL running back Terry Metcalf. I, I imagine there were expectations that came along with that. There were, and I mean, just everyone in, in Seattle just that's all they talked about. You're going to play football. And I, and I started at seven years old. And because my parents had me when they were young, I, I was able to see my dad actually play when, when I was younger. So I, I loved football. I always wanted to play football. I wanted to be my dad growing up. I always wanted to wear 21 when he was growing up, when I was growing up. Uh, fortunately, I, I, I ended up in number two, which became my favorite number because I wore that all the way through. But I, I just wanted to follow in his footsteps. I actually wanted to be better than him, but I, you know, I just wanted to be like him. And so any expectations that people had, I mean, the, the pressure I had on myself was, was far greater because I wanted to be good. I and mean, we, only, we only have pressure if, if you're not very good at it, I think. And so mm-hmm. I think uh, I knew I was good enough where I didn't worry about being the son of Terry Metcalf because I knew I was going to go over there and forge my own footsteps. You probably heard all the whispers, though, from the guys on the other team. His dad's in the NFL, even f- probably from some of your teammates. I do, oh, of course, even you know. But they can, how much do they talk after four touchdowns? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, I really, his dad's in the NFL, and maybe he will be too. You know. So. Gil Brandt, who knew a thing or two about scouting players, said when he saw you, "This guy is a carbon copy of his father. Same legs, same running style." same abilities was was that true did you did you see that comparison there are a lot of similarities i think uh to be honest he he probably ran a little tougher in between the tackles because that's that was just his style but i was a lot faster and so you know like gills like you said he's great at it and so you you can definitely see especially if you put our films together it's the, it's almost the, the same person and it's it just my friend likes to tell me that my dad just looked rough, and and, and I looked smooth. <laughs> sick. Yeah. And I, so you were I, a polished I, version I, of dad. So I was like he he was he was he was rock and I was jazz. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, you said you were faster than him. Do you remember racing against him when you were coming up when you were young, and then the first time you took him? No, we never really raced like that. But I knew uh, when I, when I got in high school that. If we had race, it, it was gonna it was gonna be a problem for him. I might not have won, but it was gonna be a problem for him because that's when I began to get fast for sure. What uh, what other sports did you play growing up? Were were you just a football guy, or I know I know the track later, but when you were a young kid, what what all were you into? When I was a young kid, I played football, basketball, and, and ran track. I mean, I loved basketball. Um, wouldn't play in high school because I knew I wasn't gonna go anywhere in that, and so. I just concentrated on, on football and, and, and track at that point, and and even so, I just I, I did track because I didn't want to get hit and 
spring ball in college. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it turns out I was pretty good at it, but you know, I just, I just didn't want to be out there because I, I, I felt like if you go to spring ball and play football, there's only bad things could happen. Especially if you're already in the, in the rotation, what could happen good for you? They're not going to change the plays. They're not going to do anything. You're not going to, you're not going to gain by being out there. But if you go out there and get hurt, you saved your body a lot of hits. You saved your body a lot of hits. So I can go out and run track, run around a little bit, travel around to some meets and, and have fun and then come back and play football. Okay, so in this hobby of yours that you took up so you didn't have to get hit in spring ball, uh, you weren't just a participant. You were a two-time NCAA long jump champ, jumping 27 and a half feet. That's world class. Don't cheat me. 27-7? 27-8. 27-8. Hey, and of course, we know every He'll inch. tell you, don't cheat. Don't, <laughs> no, don't cheat. No. No, no, you know inches can't matter sleep, in that game. Can't sleep on it. Don't, don't cheat me. That's world class. But at the time, there was another pretty good, a couple of pretty good American jumpers. Uh, lots. So at the 88 trials, you go and there's Carl Lewis and Powell's there. And this is a world class. Some of the Conley. greatest jumpers Mike Conley, Mike Larry, Conley Larry was there. Myricks. Take us, take us back to to that event. You're competing against Carl Lewis, who I'm sure, uh, although you were competing against him, you had to look at him with some awe, I would imagine. And in awe, when I was in high school, uh, I had a whole wall dedicated to him. So he was your guy I coming picked, up. Because I wanted, because I knew I wanted to play football, but. In track, I wanted to be like him as far as running and, and, and long jumping. So you came out highly touted as a jumper. Yeah. And a guy was certain, you know, that could could be an, an Olympian one day. Right. So, yeah. And so, yeah, going to that '88 year, the, the funny thing is, we had TAC championships before Olympic trials, which a lot of young folks don't know what the TAC championship was. That's the U.S. championships then, which I actually won, and that's where I jumped 27.8 and whatever change, and so. They put me on track and field news to cover of it. And so I was, they were talking about the next Olympian. I was like, no, no, no. In my mind, I was like, no, don't, don't even think about this because it's going into my senior year of football. The Olympics were in Seoul that year and they were in September. So in order for me to go, that means I would have to miss football games. So I was telling people, uh, if, even if I make it, I'm not going. So I think that's the only time in my life I ever walked into something uh, not really wanting to win. Not that I would have won because of the great jumpers I was competing against, but I didn't really care because I had already made up in my mind that I wasn't going to win because I, I wanted to try to win the Heisman, which I wouldn't have won anyway because I ended up getting suspended that year and Barry <laughs> Sanders was, was there doing his thing. Yeah. But, you know, just, just going out there and, and competing against those guys was, was special because those guys could jump 28 feet at the drop of a hat. They can roll out their bed and do that. And so just, just watching Carl and, and Mike Powell and those guys compete and being in that group and considered one of the elite like them was, was, was special for me. How do you think being in that environment, competing really against world-class athletes, how did that impact how you viewed playing in the NFL against the greatest football players in the world? Did that, did that help prepare you for big moments? More so mentally, I would think about, you know, just being in track and field. When you're on that runway, it's you and only you. You can't control anything that anyone else does when they're competing. And so if you just take care of your business, it, it'll, you'll do well. And so when I step on the, same, on the football field, I would have that same mindset that although it's a team game, I have to do my job and I have to do it well in order for the team to be successful. So that, I think that that uh, transpired and, and, and helped me in that respect. What was it that attracted you to, to Austin? Well, I actually committed to, the, to Miami, to the U. Really? I committed to, my parents weren't having it. <laughs> <laughs> they said no way. I was 17 that years old. That was a old. wild time at the U. <laughs> right, I was 17 years old and I would have played my, I played my entire freshman year at 17 and didn't turn 18 till after. Wow. The January after. And so they, they, they weren't having it. They wanted, I, you know, I went to Catholic school my entire life. Yeah, they're not sending their and baby they, they, to you. They wanted me to go to Notre Dame. 
And I, and, and I said, I'm not going to Notre Dame. I'm, I don't want to do this Catholic school thing anymore. And, and then, you know, I was, after I knew I wasn't going to go to Miami, I started thinking about track. Because Miami, I was willing to just say, forget track, even though they had a small track team at the, at the time. I mean, it's since then grown, but back then it was, it was a small track team. So I was going to be like, I'm just going to go play football, and win some national championships, and, and have fun. So I, like, commit committed within two hours of my visit. I'm in. Really? I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. And they had a, a, a rich track program, too. <laughs> they didn't then. No. They didn't, no, back then they didn't. Really? That's why. Because that's they every, put some jumpers out. That's what everyone kept saying. You're going to go there. They don't even have a track. Did huh? you help start that jumper tradition? Well, Texas, we had, I pretty much started it. And we had, we had some good jumpers before me. But, um, but after that, since then, we've had a lot of jumpers come through there and, uh, and I'm still a record holder. And, and so every time I, I talk to him, I tell him, you can break the record out and I applaud you. I, I want you to break it. But just remember this, I said it when I was 20 and never jumped again, because I only jumped three years in college. I knew that you were, you know, coming out of Texas, you were, you were highly touted, but the one number that really jumps off the page, and Texas has had so many great football players you're the only player in the history of Texas Longhorns football to lead the team in all-purpose yards all four years. What do you think when you hear that? Knowing the greats, the all-time greats that have played there. Well, you can take that two ways. I mean, first of all, when I was at Texas, we only won 24 games. So we, we, we weren't very, Someone had to get the yards. We, I know, so we weren't very good. So, you know, I came in and I, and I played from start to finish, um, freshman to and senior year. And then you have the Earl Campbells, the Ricky Williams, and, and all those guys who've come through after that. And someone was always there before them. So they weren't getting so, four years as a So starter. they weren't getting four years at the start, and, and, and they might have been playing, but they weren't getting all the touches. And whereas I was returning kicks, punts, uh, didn't start as a freshman, but you know, still was catching catching passes and 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 running the ball, and, and a lot of those guys didn't catch passes at all. So I, you know, I had an advantage, but but it, you know, you're downplaying it, man. That's still that's but, impressive. But, <laughs> that's still very but, impressive. But it is, especially just because of the running backs who've come through there, and, and all the guys who've won Heisman's and Dope Walkers and everything like that, and and been all American. So I, I I can say I have that on there. Yeah. In 1986. Your dad ran into some troubles, put himself into rehab, and you said um, he wanted you to visit him there, and and um, he felt that was important. What what did you learn? What was that whole process like for you, and why was it important for you to go? Well, you being in college and, and young, walking up into the rehab and was up in New York, the first thing I thought was, oh, I don't want to be here. I don't want to come in here, you know, because the, the, the way they were living, and I mean, it's, it's not, it wasn't a bad situation, but you know, it's, it's almost like jail. And so my dad just wanted me to see it because he, he, he wouldn't tell me until I, I got older, but he always said he knew I was going to the NFL. He wanted me to see the, the pitfalls that could happen. What, what was the best advice dad gave you about being an NFL player? And I don't, I don't mean run fast, run hard. I mean, just about managing the entire gauntlet that is being a professional football player. To be honest, he never really gave me any. Really? Yeah, because he always said that he wanted me to live it myself. Wow. Because he had that opportunity. He said he did not like watching fathers do that to their child. Just, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to so do that. So he was hands so, off. So he was hands off and just let me do it. He, even, even in high school, he helped coach at our high school team, but he wouldn't coach running backs. They really? Asked, he, I knew he was your high, yeah. one of your high school coaches. He, he, that didn't know, he, so he never actually coached he you. He never actually coached me. Dinner table talk? <laughs> no, we never, never? no, we never really, no. Because, like, I think, I think it was just because, like, like he said later, that he, he knew I was, I was going to be all right. It's just a matter of... Uh, me staying on the straight and narrow. I mean, I, I know when we went to, I see, I hear stories later. I love when I went on my visit to Texas. Uh, we were, they were playing Texas a and when I visited Texas a and beat the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I know my dad 
because somebody told me that. I know my dad looked over at the recruiting coordinator and said, you guys need my son. Really? And that's, you know, so he would say stuff to other people. But not to you. But, but never to me. And I, you know. Was he hard on you? Not at all. So he just really was completely hands just, on, just indifferent. Let me, just let me do my thing. Did, yeah. did you appreciate that looking back on it? I, I did. And, I, and, you know, I think I do that with my son. I, I mean, I try to give him a little, a few blurs from here and here and there. But I try to let him do it and just, and just try to figure it out. Because, for one, I don't want to be the reason that something doesn't go right. So you put jumping behind you in 88. And then we're ready to focus entirely on your future as an NFL player. When, when you were drafted by the Browns in the first round, what, what did they tell you as to how they were going to use you? Did you have any idea what they were going to do with you? I had no idea, but first I said, oh, no. Really? <laughs> I, I was like, oh, no. It was a couple of days before the draft. I was in, in Austin, Texas, and Mike Lombardi came down there to the school to visit me, and he was asking me to, to run the box test and everything, and I said, I'm not doing it. He's like, we're thinking about drafting you. I'm like, I'm not doing it. And then he's like, I flew all the way down the first. I was like, first you didn't tell me that you were coming. So he just he surprised you, yeah. showed up, said, and, let's, let's and go. I, and, I'm, and I'm not doing it. And so after he left, my, my uh, college roommate asked me, why didn't you do it? I said, well, first of all, I didn't know they were coming. Secondly, what if I go out there and run that box slower than they think I should? As a small guy, now they're going to, oh, no, we don't need him. He's, so I'm, you're just going to have to go on what you saw on film. And go, and, and, and go from there. Did you not want them to draft you? I, I, at the time, I, I was into the glamour and the glitz because I was too cool. So I, was, I, wanted the, I wanted the Rams to draft me. <laughs> I wanted the Rams to draft me. And it, it's, it's funny because on, on draft day, I, was at, uh, I had a family gathering. I didn't go to New York or anything, so I was in Seattle. And we were, we were watching the draft. And... Uh, the 13th pick came up. It was it was Denver Broncos, and uh, they said the the uh, Denver Broncos would trade the pick. And I looked at my mom and said, "I'm about to get drafted." Really? Yes. And then they said they trade to the Browns. I said, "I'm about to get drafted," and I did. And I and I don't know and I don't know why I thought that. I mean, I thought maybe I I think. Where that, were you projected to go? Uh, first round. First round for sure. Uh, I, I think top 20. I think. Uh, they might have known that I think the, the Jets had a lot of interest and they were 14th. Mm -hmm. And so. So Cleveland moved up. So Cleveland So they moved get up. you before they did. And got me. And your thoughts about becoming a Cleveland Brown? I was like, oh, it's going to be cold. <laughs> it's going to be cold. They play on grass. I don't know how this is going to work. I've been in Austin, Texas playing on artificial turf so I can be real so fast. You were thrilled about so coming I, to Cleveland. And, so, and, then, and then I come. For, for mini camp in May, and I can't practice because I don't have a contract at the time. And so I'm just standing around and it snows. It snowed in May. It snowed. And I was like, oh. Get me out of here. I don't know how this is going to work. I, don't, I, I just don't know. And at what point did you say, okay, this is, this is fine? I think, you know, just once, once I got here full time and got to plan because I held out all uh, the way up until. I played one preseason game. Yeah. And so I held up all, all the way throughout training camp. So once I got in with the guys and, 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 and got to practice and, and, and run around and, and, and do things, then I, I started to feel good about it. And we, and we were winning games. So that, make, that makes a big difference for sure. Did you at any point wish that it hadn't been Cleveland, even after you started playing? Now that I've played, the only thing I wish is that I could have played my entire career in Cleveland. Really? Really. Really. I mean, unfortunately, uh, it wouldn't happen because the, the team moved. But, and I, but if I hadn't got traded, I would have thought in my mind that I would have played in Cleveland for my entire career. That's, that's what I wish now. You like just, playing here? I, I love playing here. I love coming back. I Why? Love, I just, it's, it's the fans. It's just, it's just being, being here in the way people love the Cleveland Browns. I mean, we had good seasons and, the, and they loved us and we had bad seasons. They still loved us and, that, and, and I appreciate that because they've been through some tough times. And so to come out here and, and, 
and play have games like two punt returns against the Steelers and, and make Cleveland Brown fans feel good about that is it, it, special to me. That means something because you know what it's like to be with another organization. I think in, in your last seven years, you were with six teams. So when you say that the Browns fans are special, it carries some weight. What do you think separates Browns fans from average fans of other teams in the NFL? Because they're, they're, they're diehards. They're not, they're not bandwagon fans in, in, in fair weather. They, they love the team no matter what. I mean, everyone hates to, to see losing. So when in the past couple of years, when stands aren't full, you got to expect that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, given what's transpired this year and the team that we put together, you can see that all the Browns fans come out and even those who are jumping on the wagon. And so it, it, it's special, but I, I just love the fact that they're behind you no matter what, no matter what, they, they love you. And, uh, and so for me, when I was here, it, it made me want to go out and, and, and do well, just score touchdowns, return punts, whatever, you, whatever have you, just because I know that the fans cared that much. It's, it's like a college atmosphere. And I, and I love that. Yeah. Who came up with the orange tape on the cleats? Who, where did that start? There, there's so many stories of who I want to get to this. the bottom of it. Let's get to the bottom. Let's dig. It was me. I thought it was. That's why <laughs> I asked you. It was me. And yeah. those guys taped and, and spray painted their shoes. I took my shoes to, to uh, a shoe repair guy and had them dye them to match the helmet. Really? So the first time, so the first time we did it, I took a uh, me and Webb, and we had him dyed, and so we we didn't even tell anyone. So we came out like in warmups, had them all taped up so you couldn't see, and then at the end we just took the tape off and had orange <laughs> shoes because I wanted, yeah. So and so then everybody else started spray painting, so it was all fluorescent and ugly, but mine matched. But the style was on point. Like it, it was. It was. When you look back at the old tape. It was uh, fashion forward for sure. Oh, for sure. And that, you know, that's, that's what I was trying to do. My dad used to tell me, you, you, you play good if you look good. And so when <laughs> I put them, those orange cleats on, I, I felt like they look good. So I expected to play good. Do you have a, I asked you about your favorite memories. Do you have a, um, a favorite game with the Cleveland Browns? The one game that when you think back about your time here, it always goes to that? I do, and it's a game that no one would ever think about because because we, we lost. We were down in, in Houston, and uh, I think it's because I I rushed for like ninety something yards and, and caught the ball for over a hundred yards. Wow! And so, in, in my mind, going into the NFL, I thought I was going to be like Roger Craig and be able to go a thousand, a thousand. Yeah. And so. That game for me was the only chance I ever got close in, in doing that, and so I, I felt like that's that, that sticks out because that's what I wanted to. I envisioned my career to be like the, the entire time. Yeah. What was it about that game where just everything was working for you, whether you're catching it or running it? I don't know. It just it, it just it just seemed to work, but you know. And I don't remember any plays from that game. All I just remember is I was ninety something yards and over a hundred receiving, and that, and I know that. That's what I wanted to do my entire career. Wow. Was the shifty aspect of your game something that, that came instinctively for you, or is that something that you were taught? It came instinctively. I mean, when I was younger, I used to watch film with my dad, but I wouldn't watch the film and then go out and practice moves. I just watch it and be like, oh, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. I wish I could do that, but I would never go out and, and, and practice moves. and. I never really, maybe, this is no lie, maybe three times in my life that I ever run through a ladder on my own. Really? When it wasn't in practice or something, yes. They never did that. Wow. And because, I, and I don't know why, because I, and I feel like I'm not, I wouldn't be good at it. I feel like I'm better if I have to react. And so, when I, when I just, when I trained for the season, all I, I ran like I was a track guy. I just go on the track and run and run. Non straight stops, burst. Straight burst. Wow. And then, but yeah, never practiced agility or anything. I got, played a lot of basketball, 
Some racket ball. Been a nasty point some, guard. Some, some <laughs> That's the problem. I wanted to shoot. <laughs> I, don't wanna to pass. Shoot. I don't want to pass. <laughs> I want to shoot. Yeah, but with those moves, you can penetrate and dish. I want to, no, I want to, you want to go all the I way. I don't want to keep going. So, <laughs> and so, and so, yeah. Did you and, love basketball? I loved it. I, yeah. love, I, I love playing it. I'm just scared to play now. I'm scared to death. But, you know, but like back to the, the question. I, so I think just it's just something God given that when God tries to come tackle me, I, I make a miss. And it just happened naturally. One, one, because I'm scared. And <laughs> <laughs> you did run. I always thought you ran like a deer. I mean, you, it, it was beautiful to watch. Your motion was, it seemed perfect when you were out there running. But when guys would lunge at you, you could, like a deer, it seemed instantly change direction without slowing down and make a matrix move and the guy was on the ground. And never practiced it. But, you know, that's... That's something I tell people, and, and it's hard to see the correlation, but I think being a long jumper uh, is, is something that, that taught me how to, to really control my body. You mm -hmm. know, because you know when you're running down the runway and, you, and you're running almost full speed, and then now you have to get yourself in p jump position and then hitch kick or hang or whatever you do. And you, so you have to control a lot of things that move in that maximum speed, and, right. and, 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 it's, and it's hard to do. And so to practice that since I was a, a little kid, I, I think that kind of helped me. This, this ground is very hollowed ground. Um, the old stadium sat in the footprint of the new stadium where we are now. I'd like to take you into the stadium and reminisce a little bit, if you're good with that. You want to do it? I'm good with that. All right, let's go. Let's do it. Well, the building around it obviously has changed, but this is still the hallowed ground that, that you played on. Yeah. When, you, when you stand here and look around, what, what are some of the things that come to your mind? First thing that comes to mind is us being on that sideline. <laughs> right. <laughs> us being on that sideline and running out the, the, the dugout mm -hmm. in, that, in that corner and baseball field and warning track still on, on, on the field and everything. And, and so it, it, it was a different place. And so I, I like the home field advantage of having that hole right here where the wind came gusting through because right. people didn't know how to, to act. It took a while it, to it figure took, that right, out. For sure. It was also, there was something about the intimacy of the dog pound being really right at the base of that hill. That was a special place. It was real close. And so I remember, you know, like, especially like scoring against the, the Steelers and the second punt return and running in and running up the little hill of the dog pound and then getting mobbed, getting hit by one of the fans. And, and so it, it was things like that that you loved. I remember going against Cincinnati and, and running up into the stands and, and, and hugging the fans and then people spilling beer all over me. And so that, <laughs> those are the kinds of things that you expected in the old stadium. When you, when you think about the times that you spent here um, and the big plays, the big wins, the big moments, Talk about how the fans sort of make, makes the occasion even even better with their reaction and, and how much it means to them on a Sunday to come out and watch Eric Metcalf break through and, and score a touchdown. Well, it was great. I mean, you know, that old stadium, you have to be a diehard to come sit up in that stadium because it was old, <laughs> but it was, it, it, it was exciting. It was, it was a special place to be in. And, I, you know, I think just coming out here and we parked across the street back then. Yeah. And so... Have, we had to walk across the street to come in the locker room, so you, you'd have to walk through the fans and talk to the fans as you're going in uh, into the game. So they're patting you on the back, telling you to go get them, whatever. And so, so you want to be, you want to go out there and perform well because you, you know these guys are all behind you and it's, and it's super loud in here, and winning or losing, it's super loud, especially if you have a, a Steeler game or something like that. And so, it was it was it was always fun to be in here. I, I love I love playing in the old stadium for sure favorite play at, at the old stadium? I think uh, my favorite play at the old stadium is a uh, kickoff return against the Bills in, in, in the playoffs in, yeah. in, in 89 because, you know, it was, it was a tight game in the playoffs for the first time. They were coming back, it just scored, and, and they just scored and you take the kick back, and that's that's what kickoff returns all all about. So stealing that momentum. Stealing the momentum, and that's what it was. 
I, I enjoy doing that. We can thank Bill Belichick for having Eric Metcalf as one of the great return men in NFL history, certainly one of the greatest punt returners, because you wanted nothing to do with punts. Tell us the story of how it came to be that you were put on punt team as a returner in the first place. Well, yeah, my, my first two years, I just returned kicks. Gerald McNeil, Ice Cube, returned punts. And, and I never really wanted to return uh, punts, but then Bill became our coach and he sat down talking to me and said, you know, I know you want the ball a lot, so if you want the ball more, you should return punts because it's give you opportun opportunity to get it four, five, six times a game more and I was like okay sign I'll, me up I'll sign me up I'll do it you know I didn't really think much of it because uh in fact my first year I bet with Bill uh, is when I separated my shoulder and so I didn't play the in entire year and so come back the next year I just I, I, I was looking forward to it because I would get on the kick kickoff team and, and they would, wouldn't really kick me the ball anyway and so they, they took me off that and, and so I was, I was looking forward to it and then you know once he starts scoring on punts, it becomes more fun. I mean, I knew I could be good at it, but but I think a lot of, a lot of times it's trusting the guys in front of you, mm -hmm. and just 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 having the opportunities. Because you know, going into it, people would uh, they would kick me the ball because we hadn't we hadn't been scoring. But once we started uh, scoring touchdowns, start kicking it out of bounds, things like that. So you know, it's it just it's just a matter of getting it together and we won't, once we got our scheme together on what we were trying to do and trying to force uh, punters to, to kick it in certain directions it, it, it got fun. Is there one play that um, I know you said there were plays that Browns fans sort of hold up but is there one play that sort of encapsulates your entire NFL career what you did what you were? I'd have to say my first touchdown against Cincinnati when I caught the swing pass and yeah I'd have to say that's that's it because I didn't want to get hit and make people miss and score a touchdown. What more could you ask? You know, and what's funny about that? And we're sitting there, and he's like, "That was a great move." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And he kept saying, "That's a great move," and I I didn't really know it because I just did it and, and scored and then and I saw the video and I was like oh okay and I was looking at the video and I looked over and say I said you know what's messed up though he touched my sock and knocked it down now the picture's gonna be messed up <laughs> fashion forward fashion forward Too cool huh? before I let you go if you're overhearing a conversation where two fans are talking about Eric Metcalf the player what do you hope you hear them say? He could do anything. He could do it all. That's what, that's what I want to hear. Because I think that's what makes you a football player. The fact that you can play more than one position. Yeah. And you did it all. Eric, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We appreciate it. And thanks so much to you for joining us on another installment of Club 46. Make sure you join us next week. We'll have a new all-time great Cleveland Brown on Club 46, driven by Bridgestone. We'll see you then.